Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a game we certainly need to turn the clocks back for. Nearly 160 years ago, Lewis Paulson competed against Paul Morphy in the finals of the first American Chess Congress. This was a knockout format tournament held in New York in 1857. This event, this American Chess Congress, was a predecessor to what we know today as the U.S. Chess Championship. So let's see how this game was played many moons ago. Lewis Paulson opened with e4, Paul Morphy replying e5. We have on board a Spanish four knights, bishop c5, both sides castle. White goes with this little tactical sequence, capturing on e5, preparing to meet knight takes knight with d4, winning the material back. Black instead activates another piece. Knight takes knight, d takes, bishop c4. The best move in this position is knight g4. And this is a move that looks to take advantage of the fact that white is absent their number one kingside defender, namely a white knight on f3. This adds a second strike to f2 and enables potential pressure with queen h4 against the white king side. There is one additional idea in mind, and I will illustrate that after h3, black can actually take twice on f2 and end with a fork of the king and bishop. b5 was played in the game, asking the bishop a very important question, which of these two diagonals will you choose? The more aggressive looking Bishop b3, staying opposite the king, can be met with bishop g4, development with tempo, and white has to do awkward stuff like queen e1, going into a pin, and maybe even there's a case where the queen could be lost. Short story here is that on b5, white needs to take up the more modest uh, post, the better post, on e2. Only at this point, only after the bishop has been kicked off of this diagonal, does black regain the pawn with knight takes e? Why is this so important? Why is it so important that black first kicks the bishop off of this diagonal prior to capturing on e4? Well, suppose knight takes e4 here. You'll note that black is without their number one kingside defender, a black knight on f6. And this would allow a tactical sequence capturing on f7 capturing on e4, and then a fork against the rook and king. White is soon to be up the exchange. Neither of those two illustrated tactics towards the enemy kings are present with these key defenders on f3 and f6. After b5, bishop e2, knight takes e, knight takes knight, rook takes knight, bishop f3. This is an excellent post for the bishop. And he's getting there with a strike, rook e6, defend c6, and now c3, preparing d4, allowing the bishop to come out, and looks to shut down black's dark square bishop. At the same time, c3 provides a gap in the white position on d3, and this is something black makes use of right away with queen d3. Is this something that white didn't see? I don't believe that that is the case. I believe white had a deeper idea in mind uh, in reply to black occupying d3 with their queen. What is that What is that idea exactly? Well, it's b4, bishop b6, a4. Now, what does this accomplish exactly, These uh, this uh, queenside expansion, b4, a4? Well, after a4 is in, it can be said that black can no longer maintain both a black pawn on b5 and the queen on d3. Why is this the case? Well, the c-pawn note is not really there as a defender of b5. It's in a pin. And how else are you to maintain a pawn here? Playing a6, well, actually there are multiple pins towards this rook. a takes b, and you're losing your rook. One other point is if you get off of this diagonal, well there is an additional point behind a4, and that is a5, and your bishop's trapped. 
short story here is that on a4, black has to give up the b-pawn, recapturing with the queen, just to show, um, well, not with that dummy move, but if a6 and a takes b, black would have to recapture with the queen, and this would allow d4, and this structure here kills the dark square bishop. b takes a was played, queen takes a, white recaptures and develops, strikes at c6 for a second time. Black defends and develops to not the best square. Better is bishop b7. The main difference between these two posts is that from b7, the bishop watches over a6. And this is a key square because it no longer allows white to challenge the black queen uh, by playing queen to a6. Okay, bishop d7. And now a move that I need your help with. Very mysterious move. Rook to a2. Don't have an answer to it. I can't quite make out what the point of rook a2 was. Uh, feel free to uh, make some suggestions or give me some insight as to what rook to a2 is doing. The only thing that I could come up with is that it preparing to challenge the queen by way of c2. But as we'll soon see, that's not really... Uh, that wouldn't be a good idea, let's just say. What black follows up with is rook a to e8. Let me point out that at this point here, rook a2, uh, again, I can't make sense of it. It is already, on this, this moment here, move 16 for white, it is already imperative that white challenge the black queen on d3 with queen a6. Rook a2 instead, rook a to e8. Or, better described, black got their last piece involved. All the black pieces are working. Queenside pieces don't really have much of a say in this position. Queen a6 is played at this point. That's one way to challenge the queen. Another, queen c2. Sure, it challenges the queen, but this is no good. Can you figure out why? If you'd like to, go ahead and pause the video. What would you play as black in this position? All right, black has a mate in two. Queen takes rook. Rook e1 mate. Queen a6 prevents this tactical sequence, this mate in two threat. Queen takes rook can be met with queen takes queen. Black has another idea in mind, though. I wonder if you can spot Paul Morphy's 17th move. If you'd like to, go ahead, pause the video. What did Paul Morphy play next? Okay, the winning continuation is queen takes bishop. Vesting a lot of material, of course. What is accomplished exactly? Well, white's kingside structure is destroyed. Isolated pawns. An open file towards the white king. Weak square on h3. Black immediately gives the check. King is flushed to the corner. Bishop h3 threatens a mate in two. How is white to fend off all of these threats? What's tried is rook d1. This allows a mate in six. Queen d3 is suggested by the computer, preparing to meet a bishop check and bishop f3 with queen takes rook. Black would have something even in that case. On queen d3, black can first play f6, and these threats are still present. In the game, it was rook d1, and as mentioned, this is now a checkmate in six. Uh, black does not end the game like that, but uh, gets it to a point where he understands that he's going to win. Goes for Black goes for a sequence where uh, they're sure they could get the white queen. At this point, it is a mate in four, starting with rook g2. The idea is uh, to capture on f2 with check, or even... Rook takes h2 and then getting into h1 for mate. There isn't a way to stop all of these threats. For example, queen d3. You can play rook takes f2, king g1. And pick your favorite spot to go with the king. It doesn't matter. In both cases, rook g1 and that's game over. Note that this is double check. After king to f1, we have the bishop revisiting g2. King has to go back into g1. A discovered check. Bishop h3, king h1, and now bishop f2. Let's just pause for a moment here. We have 
all white pieces are on all the white pieces are on the queen side and all the black pieces are on the king's side where is the white defense it's just not there uh, and the threat here is to simply give mate on g2 now that g1 is covered there's no pawn anymore so there's no pawn anymore on f2 so the bishop controls g1 black saw with this variation that white has to now give up the queen and does with queen f1 to defend g2 bishop takes queen rook takes the attack continues rook e2 very active pieces and still uh, these queenside pieces are doing nothing this pawn is in a pin white gets out of it with rook a1 rook h6 targeting h2 after now d4 a nice finishing touch here is bishop e3 preventing bishop takes rook and looking to crash through for mate it is at this point that paulson resigns after bishop e3 white resigns bishop takes bishop would run to a mate in one and then two and there's no good defense against that because g1 is covered uh, in the computer's eyes, rook f2 is best, but this is, of course, losing for white. So, very interesting game. Uh, I have a couple things that I want to share as a close. One is a question, and that is, on this move 17, did you spot this tactic? And the other thing is, if you did not spot this tactic with queen takes bishop, how might you have uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that white is without two pieces. They're not playing with the queenside rook. They're not playing with the queenside bishop. And there is uh, a significant amount of pieces that black has in play. Clearly along the e-file, uh, the bishops are both pointing towards the king. This might be your cue to look for outlandish type moves like a queen sacrifice especially one that will impair uh, the enemy king's structure severely double isolated pawns isolated pawns we have a, a lot more ag aggressive pieces when we consider attacking pieces uh, versus defending pieces where are the defending pieces for white there's just a rook around, but there are two rooks and two bishops here attacking the white king. These might be some things to look into. Uh, these might be some good visual cues for you to maybe spot these sort of tactics in a position, just recognizing uh, those imbalances, number of attackers versus number of defenders. So, uh, very interesting game. Uh, it's quite typical with the Paul Morphy games that he has this... Uh, initiative uh, something that is brought about by having a lead time wise and it often finished in uh, a beautiful fashion and in this case with a queen sacrifice so uh, as usual i hope you're able to take something away from this game and feel free to leave any feedback in the comment section below that's all for now take care bye